we have the best praise and worship team here? Don't bring the dick bear out. All right, if you would, please repeat Second Chronicles 7 14. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. And I will hear from them, forgive their sin, and heal their way. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God has the word. I will make it a land to my feet, and a light to my path, and I will hide this word in my heart, that I might not sin against God. I pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and for the Savior, for the King of the Saints, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty to the law of the week. All right, you may be seated. Thank you, everybody. You know, this is a very special weekend. Tomorrow being Memorial Day. Um, you know, tomorrow is about the, all the men and women who sacrificed their lives for each and every one of us for our freedom. You know, let's uh, let's keep tomorrow in prayer. You know, just constantly re remind yourself how special tomorrow is. Every day is a special day because they've done that, but tomorrow is especially a, uh, a very special day. So let's um, let's keep all of our fallen men and women in prayer, and uh, the ones that still serve today, keeping us safe and giving us our freedom to do what we're doing today together. To you know, to uh, be in church, allowing us still have freedom. Um, keep our uh, our nation in prayer. You know, as we're coming out of this COVID nineteen thing, that the you know the curve stays flattened. And, you know, people are starting to get out of the house and move around more. And uh, I just pray that, you know, that everybody's starting to get over this, get put behind them. And uh, start, uh, start moving forward. Brother Jared, would you lead us in a prayer for our, uh, our country? Would you pray for Israel? Would you pray for our leadership from our presidents down to our mayors? And um, just, just, just pray for everybody. We need prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Grace and mercy, Lord. We pray uh, for the United States of America from the highest uh, office to the lowest. Um, guide our leaders, Lord. We pray that you guide the leadership of this church as well and the uh, churches around the country preaching the true gospel of salvation. Thank you for the men and women who have served in the uh, armed forces, Lord, uh, those that have given their lives and those who are still alive and serving. Fighting a good fight in the name of freedom, Lord. We just thank you for uh, the sacrifice that all of these people have made on our behalf. Uh, draw us closer to you, Lord. Help us uh, guide us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen. Amen. Two or three things before we get started. I want to turn that down just a little bit. Problem. <coughs> Two or three things. Uh, this is my last Sunday for a couple of months. We take off to Florida on our retreat time, see the grandbabies. So please keep us in your prayers. And we appreciate you allowing us to have this time. Um, Pastor Glenn and Brother Barry will be tag teaming in and out. They're going to do a wonderful series on some laws of the Old Testament. Don't miss it. It is worth the listen. The world is changing. Tomorrow we observe those that were willing to die for liberty. In today's world, it's hard to find someone to stand up for their liberty. So when you say a little prayer, 
tomorrow for all those families that have been affected, uh, for what Memorial Day stands for, for strength. Remember that the United States of America was founded on God and His principles. Amen. And it is worth fighting for. Now, I won't be with you for Father's Day, so I'm going to give you my dad joke now. <laughs> Lorna said, just write it down and give it to Barry or Glenn to do on Father's Day. And I said, no, I'm not giving up my joke. <laughs> so, what state do you call one that describes a small pop? Answer, Minnesota. his land, a reset button for uh, our salvation and our lives, and a reset button for repentance. God wants you to succeed and flourish as you serve him. And as encouraging as that word was, now we come to the next chapter, and it's just as encouraging, only it's a little tougher. This is the sermon we're calling Ifs. In Leviticus chapter 26. There's 11 ifs in this chapter. Read it when you get home. I'm going to highlight it so that you can see it. But I want you to understand something. This is how God works. This is the law. When God wrote chapter 26, this is the direct word from God. This is how he thinks. This is how he operates. This is something we need to know. And I will tell you, when people said in my office, devastated by their life. They're always surprised why God would do this to them. Well, maybe you should read the law of His Word. So we are in the ifs. These are the conditions that God demanded for them to occupy the land that He was giving. Today we'll find obedience is the grounds of blessing. Now, as I was studying this sermon, according to J. Vernon McGee, he said it this way, that God loves you and he wants to shower blessings upon you. But we always put up umbrellas of indifference and sin and stepping out of his will to deflect those blessings. I've said it multiple times. Serving God is easy. God has laid it out for you. It's like looking down the hallway and God there, straight shot, and you here. And to serve Him, all you have to do is walk to Him. Well, we turn out the lights and throw marbles down on the floor. We make it very difficult when it does not have to be in serving God. Three points on the law. The first point is the condition. Serving God comes with conditions. Starts out, I am your God. Okay, there's the basis. And then we go through verses 1 through 13, but we're only read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll pick out from there. It says, Do not make idols for yourself. Set up a carved image or sacred pillar for yourself, or place a sculptured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am Yahweh your God. You must keep my Sabbath and revere my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. Pretty straightforward. We are to put nothing in front of God. Your walk should be about serving your God. And nowadays, you can consider anything in idols. We don't go out and carve a, a 
an idol in our front yard to worship it. But however, sometimes there's folks that worship their yard. There's sometimes that there are vehicles or material things that they put above their God. Or their own desires they put before their God. Anything that detracts or takes away from God being able to use you in his service is an idol. God wants to be first. Did I mention that? Because if not, I will do it again. Amen. So, this is so important that it is repeated in Deuteronomy 7.25, Deuteronomy 11.16, Isaiah 42.8, 1 John 5.21. You get my point, right? God wants you to understand He needs to be first in your life. So we go to verse 3. This is the first of the ifs. If you follow my statutes and faithfully observe my commands. That's verse 3. If you follow my statute and faithfully observe my commands. In other words, if you put me first. If you embrace sacrifice to serve. If you die to self to allow God to be first, if you seek God in the decisions that you make, if you are obedient when God calls upon you, if you're willing to do those things, that is what God's after. So, we see that if you follow God's promises, and in the next 10 verses, all the way to verse 13, you will receive the following. You will receive rain, which is very important, except for about four nights ago when I raced boats in my basement. <laughs> you will receive food. <clears throat> you will receive peace. You will receive the blessings of no wild animals coming into your villages. You will receive no sword against you. You will see that you, you increase your abilities. You will grow in population. God will live with you. And he will give you freedom. That's what the next ten verses are. God simply wants top billing in your life. He wants to be first and he wants you to worship him. He is a jealous God. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 10. Reads this way. Dull the minds of these people, deafen their ears and blind their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their minds and turn back and be healed. We dull our minds. And it could be society rubbing against society, rubbing against sin. It could be Satan pulling tricks upon us. But we dull our minds when it comes to serving God. How do we do that? We don't spend quality time in, in studying God's Word. Pastor Glenn is uh, adamant about God's Word, and I thank him for that. He's even up my game studying because I can't have him out doing But we dull our minds because we don't study our word. We dull our minds because we don't have a strong prayer life. We dull our minds and deafen our ears because we quench the Holy Spirit of self. Self wants what it wants and it doesn't care what God wants. These are the things that dull your walk. And if these things are in place, then you will not repent because you're not hearing what God wants from you. God is a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14. You can write that down. I did not put these verses in your program today. Exodus 34, 14 says, You are never to bow down to another God because Yahweh, being jealous by nature, is a jealous God. It's just that simple. So if you get the rewards and the blessings by serving your God 
It's not a bad deal, do you think? <clears throat> Seems like it's going to make life a whole lot easier just by serving your God, because He's going to provide for you just like He promises that He will. Seems, on paper, the right thing to do. So why couldn't they do it? If, you're, if you study your scripture, you see that how Israel got taken away and, and conquered all the time. Uh, Babylon and Persia and on down through and Rome. Finally at last, you see the failure time and time again because they wouldn't put God first. You see the failure time and time again and being captured in the devastation of war and swords coming upon them and being ruled by enemies. You see all this time and time again and God says in this word right here he promises if you put me first I will supply your needs but time and time again they didn't do that they bowed down to other idols they bowed down to other things they wanted their self stuff first wait a minute though before you judge them how about your life I mean it's the same today as it was yesterday and will be tomorrow. God's a jealous God and He wants to be first in your life. And if you let Him be first in your life, He will give you the blessings that you need and the provisions that you have need. Right? Yeah. How about your life? How many times have you been conquered? How many times has the sword come against you? And we all wonder why? I don't get it. Why, Lord? Why, Lord? When we really know if we study His law, but we go our mind so much that we don't even see how far we've walked away from God. We've deafened our ears. We can't even hear the Holy Spirit talking to us anymore. Then bills come. Health issues. Fiery darts of temptation. Your kingdom is under attack, under siege. Waiting for Satan to conquer it. Why? Because we have turned away from God. The simplest thing to do by keeping God first in our lives and we've turned away from Him. Not so easy to judge the Israelites now, is it? But if we just know the law, we just understand God's nature and who He is. I wish there was a book that we could read and study so that we can get closer to God, so that we would know these things and how to offer our life. If there was just such a book, such a God's word that He would just bless us with it, give it to us, and promise to keep it pure. Wait a minute. This is called the Bible. It's full of good knowledge. I've got a Bible on my desk downstairs that's falling apart. I won't get rid of it because I love it. You can see the Bible scars on this one. Don't be surprised about life. Be informed about it. Understand whom you serve. Second point is consequences. Did you know that there's consequences to your actions? You know how you tell a conservative from a left-wing liberal? Because when a decision comes, the conservative asks, what's the consequences? It's true. You have to care about what is going to happen. You have to weigh it out and understand it and be fully full of knowledge. Verses 14 through 17 contain the next two ifs. If you don't obey, I'm not going to read it, we're going to run a short on time, but I'm just going to give you the Reader's Digest version. If you don't obey, 14 through 17 says that there will be terror in your land. There'll be wasting disease and fevers. There'll be death There'll be crop failures. There'll be enemies that eat your crops. You'll be defeated and ruled by those who hate you. If you don't obey.
If you choose today to lead your life instead of following your God, then there will be consequences to your decisions. I call this two by four therapy. This whole chapter is why I named it two by four therapy. Verses 18 through 20. We come up against another F. Romans 1.18 says, For God, that's Romans 1.18, because I didn't write it down. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness suppress the truth. So 18 through 20 says this, If you still deny me, your discipline will be seven times harder. I will break your pride. The sky will be like iron and the land like bronze. Working your fields will be double hard and worthless. There will be no food and there will be a famine. I got to tell this story because I love telling these personal stories. Travis, when he was a teenager, his mama kept telling him to clean his room and it continued to get worse and it would get clean. So I considered that disrespect. So I went in and I told him to clean his room. That went on for about two more weeks. And you get, yes, I will, I will, I will. Two more weeks. We come home and had enough. Had enough of it. So I got him out of bed, snatched him by his ear. I took him to his room. I grabbed my kitchen chair, I set it in front of his door. I had a cup of coffee in my hand to sit there, and I said, now you will clean this room until you come out of there. I don't need you staying here watching me. Apparently you do. Clean this room. And he went on and mumbled something, and, and my hearing's not the greatest, but I thought it wasn't pleasing. So I told him, I'll just start taking things away from you as punishment. Then I get that, I don't care. I don't care. And I had enough. I got up and I said, you will care. I will find something. I will continue to take away from you until I find something that you care about. If it even means taking a bed out of your room and making you sleep on the floor. You may not love me right now, but you will respect me. That's the same two by four therapy we get. And that's what God's describing here. You don't want to obey me. Okay, that's fine. Then I'm going to set my kitchen chair down get my cup of coffee, and I am going to put the punishment or the disciple or discipline to you until I find something that you really, truly, finally care about. Verses 21 and 22, another if. After he lays these punishments out, he says, if you're hostile towards me or mad at me for the discipline, I'll crank it up even a little more. I'll multiply the plague seven times harder. I will allow wild animals to come into your town and eat your children and your livestock. I will reduce your population through famine, disease, and death of by animals. God has a mission here. And I don't want you to miss it. He is a loving God. He is a just God. But the mission here is for you to bend your knees and come back to Him. That's the whole mission. And everything that He's doing is worthless unless you do that. So He cares enough about you to make sure that He gets your attention. Verses 23 through 26. Another if. If you don't accept the discipline that I am pouring upon you, I'm at it. And even get hostile towards me. It'll be seven times harder. I will allow the sword to come against you. I will allow pestilence. And you will be defeated and there will be famine. So all the blessings for obedience in the first ten verses that were talked about. In 13 verses are not being taken away. All the protections. All the provisions. Until he gets your attention. Verses 27 through 33, another if. I'll find it here. 
And if in spite of this you do not obey me and act with hostility towards me, I will act with furious hostility towards you. I will also discipline you seven times for your sin. <clears throat> It'll get so bad that if you go on and you read through the verses all the way to 33, it describes eating people, destroying your religious altars, heaping dead bodies on them. This all happened in Israel's future when Ananias took it. He sacrificed pigs on the altar. He destroys the temples. He will reject you. He will destroy your cities, your land. Your enemies won't even want it. It will be so desolate. And you will go into captivity. Now look at verses 34 and 35. Because this should be in big bold print. Even through all this, God is in control. And he gets what he wants. Verses 34 and 35 says, Then the land, this is after they go into captivity, says, Then the land will make up for the Sabbath years during the time it lies desolate while you're in the land of your enemies. At that time, the land will rest and make up for its Sabbath, which tells me that they are not following God's law. But God's going to get the land to rest, but He's just going to do it a different way. And as long as it lies desolate, it will have the rest it did not have during the Sabbath when you lived there. God says every seventh year it needs to be a Sabbath year. They decided not to listen to God. They decided to break those laws and be disobedient. And God says, okay, when I cart you away with the enemies, it will get the rest that I told you to give it. Verses 36 through 39 says, Even the remnant of people that I leave there, because God always leaves a remnant, even the people that I, live, that I leave there, the ones that are following me, they will live in fear. They will do everything and then turn their heads to make sure nobody's coming to get them. Even those that were obedient, there's the atmosphere is going to be a fear. You can feel a little bit of that today if you allow it with the media and the news that you're seeing. And they're always, always stoking fear. People are afraid to go out. People are afraid to do this and that. Be careful. Be cautious. Be wise. But don't be fearful. Verses 40 through 46. Another if. Proverbs 28, 13 says, The one who conceals his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. God is flat out telling you, if you want to live your life, if you want to hide your pet sins, if you want to call the shots in your life, if you don't want to follow him and you're belonging to him, but you decide to be disobedient, it is not going to be an easy path for you. He will bring you back into the fold. But the blessing of this is, is that he wants to love you and bless you. With true repentance comes true mercy. Comes true grace. Another if through 40 through 46. If you come back and confess your sins and turn from your unfaithfulness, unfaithfulness Forgiveness will be given. What beautiful words that is when you're coming back to God, isn't it? Forgiveness. Why? Because that was God's goal all along. You turn around and see desolation. He turns around and sees a blank canvas to work with. You may see your entire life being destroyed, but once you realize when you come back to God and He's blessing you ten times that much that what you got rid of had to go. It had to go. 
It was destroying and rotting me from within. Why does God do all this? Why don't he just give up on you? Why does God do all this? Because you're worthy of it. And I know when you're in a position, that's tough to believe. Satan is pointing your fingers. He's telling you what trash you are and that you don't deserve to serve God. And look what you've been doing. And you just, you're too far wrong and you're too far away. But God, even with the hand of discipline, believes you're worthy of the time. And we're not worthy because of what we do. We're worthy because of what His Son did. And He wants to use His he wants to love us. He wants to share blessings upon us. He wants you to have a prosperous life. He wants you to be happy. But we just get in our own way sometimes, don't we? We just turn from God's laws and His love. We just decide to walk away just like our teenage kids do sometimes. Or the early years when they want to call their shots and spread their wings and ten foot tall and bulletproof until they get smart enough to realize that God is in control. God is where it's at. Serving Him is what a privilege it is. God believes in you. He loves you. He believes that you're worthy to serve Him. He has given you unique gifts and talents, and everybody is different. You may have even the same gift set, but you go about it differently, and it is so beautiful to see. And God loves the worship. Matthew 6.10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That's our goal. To serve God in a way here that we represent, that we become the ambassadors that we're supposed to be. And we represent God in a way that people will be drawn to Him. Why? Because He loves them too. Just as much as He loves you and me. They may not have a relationship, they may not know who He is, but His unconditional love is for them as much as it is for me. Well, I've been serving Him for 40 years. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That each and every one is worthy of God's love. I don't know where your life is today. I don't. I don't know the boneheaded choices that you made. I don't know the mistakes. I don't know where you're at in your walk or if you study God's word I don't know any of those things I do know this I am a self-proclaimed chief bottle washer when it comes to sinners I make boneheaded mistakes I make choices of self I fall short daily but all I gotta remember is that I'm still worthy because God loves me unconditionally I get up and I take another swing at it. So wherever your life is today, maybe you know God, but you've walked away. God believes you're worthy. So do I. Maybe your walk is there, but it's not where it needs to be. Maybe there's things that take precedence over God. If you're a true believer, a true disciple, God won't let that stand. Maybe you don't know who God is. Maybe you don't have a relationship. That's okay too. There's a reason you're here today. God loves you unconditionally. There's one thing that a believer should never do to an unbeliever, and that's judge them. They don't know God. They deserve our unconditional love and mercy and grace to show you who God is. And if they are a believer, we should support them and encourage them and help bring them back to where they need to be. We don't point fingers here. Because God loves you just as much as He loves me, and I understand that. And 
I know for a fact that he's talking to you today. My prayer is that you will follow what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do today. The altar is open for you. We'll have the social distancing. Maybe you want someone to talk with or to pray with. Slip up your hand. We will send somebody to you. We'll take you back there to the prayer room. And you can have your one-on-one talk. I have another corner over here. If there's another hand, maybe you just don't feel like walking up there. I tell you what, raise up your hand. We'll send a prayer over to you. I don't know why, and I'm not pressuring anybody, but God's just flat out telling me. If there's someone that needs to confess or a testimony right now, and you're willing to, by faith, to stand up and do that in front of everybody so that you can hear, I'm going to give you a minute before I give the invitation. If there's a testimony, if there's someone that wants to confess anything, take this minute to do it, and then we're going to move on. You know what God's telling you. All right. Bow your head to me, if you will. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can change that. All you have to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost, and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours. And I will follow him for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head still bowed, every eye still closed. If you said that prayer today, if you started your discipleship in the family of God, through our video ministry, welcome to the family of God. We invite you to come here to Shine Light Baptist Church. Address is on the screen. When you're comfortable, want to tell us about that decision, and we'll help start you on your path. If you have a home church or a family has a church that you're comfortable in, then we encourage you to go to that pastor. <coughs> you the choice that you made so that they can start you on your path. If you're here today and you said that prayer, no one's looking around. Just raise your head and look up at me. And I just want to ask you three questions. You can nod the answers to me. Would there be one? Maybe you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And maybe your walk is not where it needs to be. Maybe you find yourselves in the throes of discipline or hard times or two-by-four therapy. Maybe you start to hear the voices being a little faint. God loves you too. And he wants you to be able to get that right. I have described to you God's law and the paths on which we choose to take have consequences. This altar is open for you as well. We love you. We want to help you. Our job here is to make your walk stronger when you leave them when it came. All right, you may raise your head, stand to us if you will, for the very least. Be able to stand with us, please. Start the invitation.